Amen. Praise the Lord for the cross. Where would we be today without it? We would be probably not much of anything without it. Because I need the cross. I was going to give you a little story today about myself and the scripture that God had given me through this song that I've been, I come across that I haven't sung this song in years. And my little cassette tape, how many are old enough to remember cassette tape? <laughs> a lot of people, cassette what? <laughs> but I used to sing with cassette tapes. This song was one of them. Well, you can't even play a cassette tape no more. So thank God for YouTube because you can type in the name of the song and say karaoke on the end and it brings up nice little songs that I can put on the computer and gives me the soundtrack to sing. And as I was singing this, I was like, man, it's been a long time. And the Lord kept dealing with my heart about the phrase in this song, whatever the cost. And so... Tonight, I want to speak to you a little bit about to follow Christ means what? It's going to cost me something? We all know that salvation is free. We cannot receive salvation by anything we do. But we will, as Christians, when we decide to follow Christ, there is a cost to pay. We're going to look at that today. If you'll turn with me in the book of Luke. We're going to chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 25 through 27. Let me pray before we start this. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to proclaim your word. Father, I just pray tonight that you would bless your word, that it will go forth, that it will complete all you intend for it to complete, and that it will not return to you void. Lord, you told me through your word and your scripture that if I opened my mouth, that you would fill it. Lord, fill my mouth with your word so that we will have ears to hear and our hearts be open to receive what you have, that we may serve you for all the days of our lives. And we'll give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're looking here at Jesus. He is speaking here. Now, you know, as a minister, I've been, I've been serving the Lord since I was a knee high to a grasshopper. I grew up in church. Now, later down in my teenage life, I would, get a, I would go astray for a little while, but God brought me back at the age of 19. I'll get more to that a little bit later. But I never really heard a lot of preachers other than, man, if you don't have Jesus, you're going to hell. And for me as a young person, to get saved and to receive Jesus were fire insurance. But at age 19, my life changed. I had an experience with him. I can hear the word, but I need to know the word. Who is the word? Jesus, he's the word. He's the truth, the life, and the way. There is no other. As much as we in this world like to try to say that this is out of date and that it's no good anymore, and we can't, it's just, I've heard people say, well, can we even believe the stories? I'm going to tell you, if I cannot believe one stroke of pen in this scripture, I need to throw the whole thing away because I can't believe in any of it. So, 
we're going to look here. Some things that Jesus tells us is not easy. And I got to thinking this week with all that's going on in my life and I see all the things going on in other people's life. Brother Robert, I love him. I thank God for him. I'm so glad that God has put someone like Brother Robert in my life that he's re the real deal. I appreciate that he preached the word without fear or favor of man. We have too many ministers standing behind the pulpits today that wants to tickle our ears. Folks, that's the last thing we need today in this day and time as Christians is our ears tickled. We need to hear the true word of God. And I thank God for Brother Robert that he's willing to preach the truth. But I got to thinking, Lord, we're doing everything for you and we're, we're serving you and we're doing all these things. Why all this stuff coming our way? Why does it feel like I'm beating my head against the wall and I can't, and I'm not getting anywhere. Why does it seem like I take a couple of steps forward and bless the Lord, but then all of a sudden a good blow comes your way and knocks you about two or three steps back? Well, let's look at here. When we choose to follow Christ, we have to do one thing. We have to consider the cost. It's not, there is great blessings in serving the Lord. I can, tell, I can tell you many blessings, and I'll share some of the things that God has brought me through in my life. But let's look at verse uh, 25, and I'm going to read. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man cometh to me and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doeth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There are some hard things that Jesus says throughout Scripture. One of the scariest scriptures to me is when Jesus said, Not everyone who call me Lord shall enter in. And they say, Well, did I not heal the sick in your name and cast out devils in your name and do all these marvelous things in your name? See, the Bible tells us that the gift, our gifts that God gives us, whether we're preaching, whether we're singing, no matter what we're doing and we're serving, we can do those things. And our gifts are without repentance, the Bible says. We can still use our gifts. But then we stand before God one day, and he has said, Depart from me, for I never knew you. That word knew, it's the same Greek and Hebrew word used back up when Joseph did not know Mary when she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. She did not know a man. So it's a form of intimacy with God. And if you're close to God and you're having an intimate relationship with him, even through our pains and sufferings, God is going to see us through it. So, We have to count the cost. And sometimes is it more than we're willing to pay? I think about it. You know, I think about the disciples. Think about them guys. There's 12 men. Jesus walking around. He hasn't even began his ministry yet. No one has seen signs and miracles. Can you imagine someone coming up to your job today and saying, hey, follow me. And you quit everything you know. You quit your family. You quit your job. You walk away from it all to follow Christ. 
Now, I don't think God will call us all to do that. But there's still some today that he calls to do that. If the Bible is correct, Jesus is staying yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. So if he's going to call people back in those days to do it, what makes us think we're any better than he, that he wouldn't call us to do that? I want to challenge you tonight. If God is speaking to you to do something, it ain't always going to go with what you think is popular. A lot of things that Jesus causes us to do is not always the popular thing to do. It doesn't always feel good. They gave up, the disciples gave up everything to follow him. Now, I want to read some scripture for you in Matthew chapter 19. We're going to look at verse 16 through 30. And I'm just going to read through these uh, right quick. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt not, thou shalt do no murder, they sh thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor the father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all thou hast. And give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration which the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that has forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So here we have scripture where Peter actually asked Jesus, Hey, we dropped everything. My fishing business, we have tax collectors left work. I mean, a lot of people say, well, man, I just can't quit because I got bills to pay. So this is where I'm going to start with my story. So at the age of 19, I come back to the Lord. I got in church, and God began to lead me. I knew that from a little boy that I was called to minister because I would go out and get the neighborhood kid. Now, I want to tell you, I live in Baymanette in Pine Grove. Anybody know where that's at? I live out behind the, I live behind the Pine Grove Baptist Church, about three miles back there. 
And if you didn't know where you were, you would think you had gotten to the end of the earth. There was nothing out there but maybe three or four houses. And I was raised in the woods, and, you know, we build huts and forts and, and made trails through the woods. And, and I would get what few neighbor kids, and our house was on a corner, and the ditch was real high. And I would get on that ditch, and I would put them kids out there on the thing, and I would pretend like I was a preacher, and I would preach to them. I would get out on my grandmother's front steps, and I would pr pretend like I was preaching, never knowing that my family was peeking through the windows, watching and listening to everything I said. They knew that the call of God was on my life. But I never knew I would have to go through the difficulties and the pains and the hurt and the suffering. I got saved when I was 12. I've been in the Pine Grove Baptist Church all my life. Now, my grandmother on my dad's side, she was Pentecostal holiness. I went to her church several times and was scared, slapped to death. And they based their, you know, they based how good their service was on how many bobby pins they had to pick up out of the floor. <laughs> and it scared me, so I just stick with Mama the Baptist. We, you know, we, we, we can be quiet and be nice and have fun, too. So at age 12, I had to call, I, I got saved. It would not be long after I got saved that my mom's mother would be shot and killed by a sniper on the side of the road as she was going to go Christmas shopping with my aunt, her mother, my great-grandmother, and her brother and sister-in-law. It was just north of Atmore on the highway as they were going to Monroe. Just before you get to the prisons, he was shooting, and my life would be totally changed. Because who expects somebody just to be randomly shooting at a car and take your grandmother. And it devastated me because I was the oldest grandchild and I was her favorite. They all, my brother and sister still to this day will tell you that I was the golden child. I'm not the golden child. I just did what I was supposed to do. I didn't like to get in trouble, so I just did what I, what I was told to do. Because, you know, back in those days, me and Mama would have a little dance if you didn't. And I didn't like that dance. So, after Grandmother passed away, she was killed the week of Thanksgiving. Um, the 20th, it was before Thanksgiving, it was on the 20th. And it was the following May, my parents of 17 and a half years divorced. And if you've ever been a kid in divorce, you feel like you're the tug of, you feel like you're the rope and your parents are playing tug of war with you back and forth. So... That totally de devastated me, and I completely got out of church. I remember being at the Pine Grove Baptist Church, and the guy was, the, the pastor was, his last name was Baker. I cannot remember his first name, but his son was Russell. And me and him was best friends. I mean, we built forts in the woods and jumped creeks and done all that good stuff that guys do. And after my parents divorced, you thought I had a plague of leprosy. I wasn't allowed back to the house because my parents divorced. And they disappeared, and I never seen or heard from him again. So it was a, just a series of things that I was like, didn't know where I was. I didn't know what I wanted to be anymore. And I lived from age 13 to 19, just any way. I started smoking 
when I was 12. By the time I was 22, well, by the time I was 17, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. At the age of 19, I finally was going down the wrong road. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Son, you go down this road, and it's going to lead to death. And I knew. I just knew. He was like, well, Brother Keith, how, how can you tell when the God speaks to you? I'm telling you, when God speaks to you, there is no doubt. There is no doubt. You know that you know that you know. So I decided I was going to get myself back in church. Got in church. I was 21 years old, and from 19 to 21, I decided I was going to, uh, I had tried to quit smoking cigarettes. Couldn't do it. I got down to two or three, I worked at Gaffer's. How many remember Gaffer's? And so I was working there full-time, going to school part-time. I ended up getting a scholarship. I didn't think I would ever sing. I sung one time a solo when I was in 12th grade, and people laughed at me, and I said, I'll never sing again. I will just sing with the radio and my hairbrush. Me and the hairbrush and the radio, we got along just fine. Nobody had to hear me. Well, God can use the craziest things to turn your life around, to lead you in the direction that you want to go. So here I'm saying all this pain and suffering but you see how it's starting to progress. God is molding me and making me through my pain and through my suffering. But I've got to be willing to pay this cost because he's called me. Just like the disciples. So I go to Opryland, USA. How many members of Opryland, USA? Don't even open. It ain't even open anymore. But me and my cousin, we would have yard sales and break the money and go to different places. And we went to Opryland this year, particular year. I was studying accounting at Faulkner in Baymanette, working at Gaffer's. And we go on vacation, and we go to this show. It was called Country Made in the USA. And it showed how gospel music played an influence, what we now had country music. And they would go through and sing these different songs. I knew every song because I've been listening to the radio and practicing with the hairbrush. So I ended up just singing along, and next thing I know, this man is standing in front of me. I don't know who this man is. He said, will you come up on stage with me? And I was like, uh, why? There's a lot of people here. Well, he coached me up on the stage. And he said, do you know this song? And I was like, yes, I know it. Elvira. Of all songs. It was not a Christian song, folk. It was Elvira. And he said, so when we get to that part, he said, can you do that? I said, well, I can't do it as deep as that guy that does it. He said, it doesn't matter. Long story short, I did it. Ended up with a audition to Opryland. I was like, God, I don't know about singing in front of all these people now. But little did I know that God was going to take that little nugget that he gave me to get back into music and change my life in a total different direction. But I had to be willing to pay the cost because now the word got out. You know, Bamanette was so small, you can't do nothing and everybody know it. So I'm standing in line getting my fall schedule. I'm still taking my business classes. I've been going to Faulkner for three years now for a two-year degree. 
I can't stop now. So the man comes down. Out of nowhere, this man comes down. He said, they want to see you. And I'm telling you, I'm on the bottom floor, and there's, I'm about halfway to the building. You have to go up these stairs and up another set of stairs and halfway down the hall. And all them people were lined up waiting. He took me in front of all them and took me up past them and set me in front of the music director. I ended up getting a two-year scholarship with music just because I sung Humbuffa and was going to get an audition with Opryland. But I knew that Opryland was not what God had intended. He used it as a tool to get me the scholarship to change my degree to music. So I'm starting all over again. I'm like, here we go. And I couldn't tell you what a half note was, a whole note, a rest. I didn't know the basic music. And here we're going to jump into this music theory. And I was flunking bad. And I said, God, you are in this. You're going to have to help me. I said, because I'm paying. The, I said, the highest score that I got on a test in that class was a 43. So the guy knew, the, the, the professor knew that I was trying, but I was, my wires wasn't connecting. I have that problem sometimes. My wires just won't connect. I can't get it, no understanding out of it. So he got this guy to teach me that the order of sharps was fat cows go down and eat bush. And then if I needed to learn the reverse of flat, I needed the B-E-A-D, greatest common factor. Next thing I know, I'm acing all the tests. I'm writing songs. Now, ask me to do that today. It ain't going to happen because I ain't done that in a long, long time. I just got through. Praise God. Well, he sent me to North Alabama. After I graduated with my degree, he sent me to Florence, Alabama. I'm going to school at the University of North Alabama, and I'm going to be in commercial music because my goal at this point was to get commercial music degree, and then I was going to move to Nashville, and I, was I knew that I probably wouldn't have a voice good enough to sing with no group and travel like my heart has always desi desired to do. But, shoot, I can work in the... Uh, music industry for the Christian music and be a part somehow. 20 hours from getting my bachelor's degree, God tells me. He says, son, I need you to quit school. I said, this ain't God. I have worked too long and too hard not to get to this place to get to this place at that point I had never had to borrow a dime to get my school but all the doors shut I tried to kick some doors open and it didn't work because I tried to kick the door open and tried to stay there I was living in the dorm and I got sick I was hallucinating so bad from the sinuses and did not know that I was dying because the room that I was in was full of mold and mildew and I was having an act reaction to it. So the school brought me down and they said, we know you've been sick and your grades have fallen, but we're going to put you on academic suspension for one year and you can come back. I knew in my heart I would never go back. Me and some buddies at school had gotten together. We had started this prayer group at the school. And we were seeing people saved at school. We were seeing people healed. We was, it was great to see what God was doing. And we were Baptists. Well, God sent us on a trip all the way across the United States, up Canada, all the way across Canada into Alaska. And we went by faith. 
And we stopped at different Baptist churches there and done youth revivals. So we had, and there were several times in that thing that we had to live by faith. Our truck broke down in a matter of a couple of times. And you're stranded in the woods in Canada where bears and mooses are. And you're sleeping on a picnic table outside. You better know you have some faith in God because that moose and bear is not going to be too friendly with you. And I was scared, I'm going to tell you. But I saw miraculous people. I saw I saw ministers that were standing behind the pulpit of those churches come to the altar and rededicate their lives. I saw youth that come and get saved by the droves. All because we was willing to do what he told us to do, even though there was not money in our pockets enough to do what we did. When we got to the border of Canada, we got had a, about a two-hour little meeting with the Border Patrol. They took us, three guys, into different rooms and questioned us separately without us even knowing. But they were amazed. They came back and brought us together and said, we cannot believe your stories came out the same. Y'all said the same thing. I said that because we're not lying and we can remember what we're doing. Because God is sending us there. And they encouraged us to turn around and go back. We said we can't. And there was time when we, and I'm telling you, if you ever decide to drive across Canada, be sure that you put you some extra gas cans in the back, filled with gas, because there's about three, there's sometimes 300 or more miles between shack and shack that has one pump. It was in 1996 when we done this. And I remember God, we come back, and they, were le- they decided that God was telling them to quit school and go to a seminary. I said, well, maybe that's what God wants me to do. So I got in my prayer closet and read my Bible because that summer I had a deadline. I had nowhere to go. I was going to be homeless. It was to pack my stuff up and come back to Bamanette. Or it was to stay in Florence. I said, God, you want me to go to you want me to go to a uh, seminary? He said, No, I don't need you to go to the cemetery. And I laughed. I said, But God, I need a degree. No one is going to allow me to minister in this day and time without a degree I said I give up the music what do you want me to do what am I to do now I did not when I say the Lord spoke to me I don't hear an audible voice he speaks to my heart and he says son he said am I not the God of the heavens and the earth did I not create the stars and the moon and hang them on nothing and call them each by name he said am I not the same God that with my own hand dug the depths of the sea he said what makes you think that that piece of paper is going to stop me from putting you where I want you I had to repent It was so strong I had to repent. I fell on my face and wept. I said, God, whatever you have for me, I'm willing to do it. I said, but I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Do I pack up my stuff and go home? Do I stay here? And I remembered this lady. She said, Keith, if you ever had a dire need, she said, open up the Bible. And wherever it opens, if the, and read the first red letter. I opened up the book. I'm sitting on my dress, on my bed. Today is the day I got to move out because other people are moving into the apartment so they can start school. And I've got to get out of the way. I opened up the Bible, and the first red letters I read was the book of Acts, chapter two. Do not leave the city. But to tarry there until you have been endued with power. 
Now, that scared me because I'm Baptist. I didn't know what he was talking about. But I had purpose in my heart that I was going to live in my truck. And I was going to stay there because the Word of God spoke that to me. We were having a little revival at the church I was attending every Thursday through Sunday. And I wasn't telling anybody. So I packed all my stuff up in my truck. I was going to go to church. Then after church, I was going to Walmart. And I had this old red beat-up Ford truck with row bars on the back. With these. And I'm going to tell you, I am not redneck country. I just hated them row bars. But I knew what God gave me that truck for because I was going to take that tent and I was going to put it on top of my hood and I was going to drape it over them row bars and I was going to sleep in the back of my truck. So that would give me time to get to Walmart, get back to the church. Everybody would be gone. I could sleep in the parking lot. Nobody would know. I would be up and gone before anybody knew. But I had prayed, you know, God, I'm trusting you. I'm willing to pay the cost. I had somebody, I went to the altar just to pray because I knew service was over and nobody knew. I had a young man come down and he said, Brother Keith, he said, the Lord impressed on my heart to come tell you that you don't have to stay in the back of your truck. You can come stay at my house tonight. He turned and walked away. Another guy come. Brother Keith, the Lord told me, impressed on my heart to tell you that uh, you don't have to stay in the back of your truck. You can come stay at my house. And I watched God begin to do signs and miracles in my life like I had never seen before. I'm like, you know, they didn't teach this in Sunday school. But what God was doing is showing me that his word is real and I can trust him and I can put my hope in him and not worry about. Are we willing to pay the cost to see God work in our lives? I mean, I saw a lady come up to me and she said, Brother Keith, she said, we were at church. She said, the Lord just wanted me to come down and pray, you to pray for me. And she said, I've been t I had hepatitis C. I have hepatitis C. I, the, and they told me it's uncurable. She said, can you just pray for me? I never touched a woman. The Lord gave me the word, and I spoke to her. I said, be it to you according to thy faith. And that was a time that, you know, for me to see if somebody fall out scared me she fell out but she came back with a report that she had no hepatitis C and had totally been healed I saw other that go, but only because I was willing to pay that cost I believe that when we as Christians are willing to pay the cost to follow Christ when we deny ourselves, take up our cross, take up our what? See, we don't want to do that these days. We want to feel good. We want air condition. Oh, Lord, if we didn't have air condition, we probably wouldn't have nobody in church. But you know, there's a day coming that our faith will be tested. Are we willing to pay the cost to see God do in our lives what so many people need him to do? There are so many lost souls out there that need to know that God is real. It's not just a story that I read in this book. Because, you know, the Bible says this is a dead letter unless the Spirit bring it to life. I can read this light, I can read this all day long. I can gain knowledge on this all day long. But until I have the Holy Spirit pushing it, I can't do anything with it anyhow. 
So, you know, I was thinking about Brother Robert. I was thinking about the things that I'm facing. But if it means that I have to live in my car again, like I did back then, I have made up my mind that I am more than willing to. Because I can remember God provided before. It may not be what I want. It may not be a $300,000 home in a nice subdivision. I'm 53 years old. I just turned 53 in, on August 30th. So six days prior to my birthday, Brother Robert was born two years, almost two years. My brother, at the same age, he turned 51 on the 11th of September, so 12 days after. I was young, but now I'm getting older. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. We can trust that God will do what he says he's going to do. Now, am I perfect? No, because there are times I like to see. I don't like just to have faith. I like to see it. And I can get a little nervous over it. But I have to keep reminding myself that God is true to his word. If I go to his word and he speaks to me, I know, well, I was walking into Hobby Lobby this past week. And I was trying to get some stuff ready for designing some fall stuff for some friends. And they had the fall stuff on this side, and they had the flowers way over here on this side. Now we're back and forth trying to, and the sign jumped out at me. I thought it had fallen off the shelf, and I jumped. And the scripture was Joshua. God is with you wherever you go. I may not have the finer things of life. I'm 53 years old. Like I said, I've never been married. I don't have children. You got to be married to have those, according to God's word. I believe what his word says. Now, has it been easy? No. But I can tell you, all you got to do is pray the Lord's prayer, and he'll get you through every day. Lord, deliver me from evil. He has delivered me. I don't have to worry because God is good. He's true to his word. He will always see that his word comes back to him and it won't be void. It will accomplish all that he wants it to accomplish. So as Christians today, I want to encourage you, no matter what you're facing, what you're dealing with, how things are going, Remember that suffering is part of it. I, none of us like to suffer. We don't like to pay the cost. But I promise you this one thing. Even if I make my bed in the pits of hell, he's going to be with me. Can I go? Is there anywhere I can go to hide from God? Is there any depth? Is there any height? Is there any place I can hide? No, he's always there with me. And he said he would never leave me or forsake me. And I've seen God do some marvelous things. Too many, I, I don't have enough time to tell you all about the story. But I did end up losing the car. Had to walk while I was up there in the snow, in the rain, thunderstorms. And I walked from Florence, Alabama to Muscle Shoals for a little job that I had at a 
resource center, a Christian resource center. I didn't have the luxuries. I've never owned a home. But you know what? I believe that God had a purpose for my life. And I may never own those things in these last days, but that's okay. Because I'm believing that I'm going to see souls saved. I'm believing that I'm going to see people healed. I'm believing that God is going to demonstrate his power and love through my life. See, as Christians, that's what this world needs. In a time that is hurting so bad and evil seems to be taken over, I'm telling you in these last days, the church is about to rise up. She is going to be restored unto God, not because of what we've done, but for his own namesake. And we're going to see God do things that people are going to get saved because I believe God don't want anyone to die and go to hell before he calls us up out of here. So tonight, as Brother Glenn comes to, the altars are here, they're open. If you need to pray, if you need, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, or if you say, Brother Keith, I just need you to pray with me because I believe God's calling me into a thing, but I'm afraid. Well, number one, fear is not of God. God's not an author of confusion. Lord, if you want me to do this thing, then you, because he will show you. He will, he will, you have to test the spirit, the Bible says. And you can test the spirit. So God ain't going to take a big one and knock you on the head. But you can test the spirits, and if God begins to show you and gives you two or three witnesses, let the word of God be established. God still speaks today. He hasn't changed. He will not go against his word, but he can speak to your heart today and lead you to where you don't know whose life you may touch or change. So as they begin to sing, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. We close. If God's speaking to your heart today, I'm here to pray with you. If you don't want me to, you can use the altar. And let us believe that God, I believe God is going to do a mighty thing here at the First Baptist in Spanish Fort. Because Brother Robert has been facing a lot of suffering and trials. But I believe it for a reason because God's going to use it for his glory. Amen.